Well, good morning, folks. It's a beautiful morning if you like overcast, rainy, thunderstormy kind of mornings. Um, ordinarily, I think they're it's neat weather, but uh, got a little bit of cabin fever. So here I am stuck in my home as you are in yours. And you, you now we're, we're looking at a week of stormy weather. So, oh joy. But God is good, and we're going to continue on. So t- this morning I'm going to read a long section. It's Galatians 4, 12 to 20. This is how Paul is continuing his plea to the Galatians. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I'm with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. That's Galatians 4, 12 to 20. And Paul in this little section here is expressing a whole lot of emotion, uh, you know, a yearning to be with his people and uh, uh, your know, fondness as he remembers how beautifully they treated him when he came to them and, uh, and who knows, maybe it was a thorn in the flesh or was, maybe he was recovering from one of his beatings or maybe he was sick, uh, who knows. But he says that they were, you know, the Galatians were so hospitable toward him and so Christ-like toward him that he said they would have gouged out their eyes and given them to him. They would have given anything just to see him him better. And now he's feeling the pain of like, you know, I'm gone from you. And he's essentially, he's, he's, I, I think the best way I could describe what he's talking about is he's saying these are like cult leaders that have come in. This is the way cult leaders work. They, they look to alienate you from your tribe, from your people, and, and set you apart from them and tell you how much they love you and then convince you that the only way you can come into a deeper relationship with truth or I'm using a, you know, air quotes around that is to be completely under the teaching of whoever the leader is. And so the personal experience of the leader becomes the guiding principle for how you have to live your life and you have to be separated from any other, you know, voices. And um, I always, I don't know, I just think it's good advice within the body of Christ if anybody ever tells you, look, you can't, you know, it's, it's bad for you to be connected to the broader body of Christ. That's probably a good reason to run. Um, and Paul gets to the end and, and says that he actually is, he's feeling great pain. He's hurting. He, you know, he, he compares himself to a mother who is in, the, in the, the pains of childbirth. And he says that, he, he says, I'm again in the pains. He says, I was, I've already given birth to you once as I saw you come alive to the gospel. And now that you're falling away, it puts me right back into the place of anguish like I'm bearing down to give birth again and I'll remain in, in labor until, until I see Christ fully formed in you or Christ formed in you and, and, and see a maturity. He says, I wish I could be with you so I could change my tone. I'd probably be more, be more gentle with you because right now I'm feeling a little angry and a little perplexed. I don't understand how you could have fallen into this trap. And um, I mean, again, there's just a lot of emotion that's here. And I think this is a deeply pastoral letter that Paul is his uh, or a pastoral section where Paul is, is, is expressing what lots of pastors feel, which is, you know, this deep desire to serve and sacrifice for the people. And also, though, to ground this in truth and, the, and the, this love for a congregation, for a group of people who are following Jesus has to be born out of a out of a love for to see them come into into full relationship with Jesus and not some sort of selfish motive to be propped up and Paul is saying here that you know something that I've felt a lot which is um, it's easy for people to drift away into some sort of personality cult where they really only follow the leader uh, and not really follow the word or become deeply grounded in the truth and um, their zeal for the gospel can quickly give way to zeal for some sort of like 
derivative message or um, or some sort of splinter or something that's actually out and out a lie. And ultimately what Paul is saying, and I think this is the mark of great leadership, is that people's desire has to be for Jesus to be, and not for the leader. It's starting to rain really loud now, so I'm going to cut this this devotional short as you can hear the rain. I just want to say, Jesus, I pray as a pastor that you would keep me in the place of, of laboring for my people, laboring for those that you have, you have given us to lead until I see you fully formed in them. Please do this, Jesus. Please do this deep work in Jesus' name. Come, on, come, come upon us, Lord, like the rain is falling now in Jesus' name. Maranatha.